Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the Journeys in Design Hub online and I've careered across almost a metre from the Rainbow Reading Room to the Journeys Cafe and joining me for a cuppa and a coffee break chat, I'm delighted to introduce Alison Harley. Hello Alison. Hi John. And you're coming in through from, I'm in Edinburgh and you're in Glasgow. Yep. Now we first met when you came east and uh, you were heading up the uh, textile and design school uh, in Gala Shields, part of Harriet Watt University, a wonderful, um, a wonderful design school, seat of learning. And through the years, our, as, as things happen, our, our paths have crossed, but we've, we met again properly, I guess, at the Burnett Klein um, Symposium which you uh, held at the National Museum Scotland in 2018. Wonderful symposium. I didn't get a chance to thank you at the time. Thank you now. Um, and a wonderful collaborative effort. Uh, beautiful website and thinking about colour, you've really drawn on the, the Bernard Klein tradition of colour in a, in a gorgeous website. And I would certainly recommend everyone has a look at that. Would you like to tell us a little bit about what's happening now in regards to the foundation? You're chair and lead trustee. Yeah, well, I'm chair and a founding trustee of the, the Bernard Klein Foundation, which we established in 2017. And then, as you've said, we launched it with a symposium at the National Museum of Scotland in 2018, which was a great success and a lot of interest. Um, so since then, we've been working on developing different aspects of the, of the foundation. Primarily, it's there. We established it to develop Bernard Klein's legacy, of which, of course, it goes across design, visual arts, I mean, and absolutely. manufacturing. Yeah. And so the, the notion of a, a yeah. Scot, uh, an adopted Scot, an emigre, um, who really uh, made Galashines his literal home and his practice down there, and it's an absorbing thing. I did um, have a little chat before our conversation about some wonderful materials, including one of our key books in the Journeys in Design Library, uh, Bernard Klein, Eye for, Eye for Colour. Yes, it was a wonderful symposium. Which was called Eye for Colour, actually, yeah. Um, so yeah, there are some primary um, purpose in setting up the foundation, as I say, is to develop his legacy. And he was in the borders for 60 years. So he, as you see, established himself there as, a, as an emigre, European emigre, coming over initially to study in the UK in Leeds and then moved to Scotland early in his career and then quite quickly set up his company, Colourcraft. So Bernard Klein was, a, you know, passionate about colour all the way through his life and, and laterally um, developed a series of work called the Colour Circle, which is about, I think you mentioned you'd seen it in Peebles, um, about I six saw. pieces of small pieces, each exploring different colour combinations and it's stunning. Um, yeah, so the, the sort of update of the, the um, foundation is that we secured uh, some funding from Heritage Lottery Fund and the William Grant Foundation, who have been very generous in supporting us actually in various projects, um, such as the, the support for the symposium. So we, we've got a year's project called Securing the Creative and Cultural Legacy of Bernard Klein, which started um, late, or it's probably January this year properly. And essentially, it's a, a project to gather the stories around Bernard, people who worked for Bernard Klein. Um, so it's oral histories. So it's collecting mm -hmm. personal narratives about people's experience. And we had, we have started the project, although obviously in our current context, you can't be doing face-to-face -face interviews. But we've managed to get um, a couple of interviews up on the website, and we've developed. The website again to accommodate interviews and as well as a journal page so that's fantastic I, i'm going to steal some of that um knowledge from and, and experience from you um 
with our linen stories, we've been collecting some oral histories of uh, women who've worked in the linen industry in Scotland mm -hmm. and working with Scotland's Voices, a new uh, initiative that helps folk across disciplines collect store oral history stories. Well, I think the, the great thing about this project is it involves not just people who have worked with him, but also are working with students in Terry Oak University. Where the archive is, is held, I think, is it? Yeah, so there's two major archives, the bigger one being the National Museum of Scotland and the smaller one being at Heriot Watt University, but they're complementary to each other. So we've had two groups of students working, looking at the archives. Um, our, the fashion communication students are just completing work inspired by him and we'll have that up on the website there's a, a bit of an introduction on the website already to the work in progress but we'll have more work about more examples of work in due course oh, very much a thriving contemporary um take on on his traditions yes yeah, so and i think really bringing bernard klein's legacy to the fore that it's not something that's historical it is still relevant today what he did in the borders really has never been repeated because he did go across these different areas and, and was driven by his own creative practice it's so much so and i think that's probably why anyone like me coming to to that life is so inspired because it's it's cross inter whatever disciplinary it it of course has a lot of focus in textiles um and paintings but it, he really stretched across um, across different disciplines. And the other thing I noticed on, on the website was in a book, a beautiful book, um, about the house. Yeah, that's a recent publication by his daughter, youngest daughter, Shelley Klein. So she's written a book called The See-Through House, which has just been published, and I think it has sold out already because it's been very well reviewed across all national papers and it's going to be book of the week in the radio, on radio Four, the 18th of may so that's great. coming up that's yeah. very exciting thank you for that little scoop um and it, so books have been a very in fact let's come on to that books have been such a a major part of your own your own practice and uh, your your work as a writer is is, is beautiful and and in particular, your focus on the voice of the artist, the practitioner. And um, perhaps we can take a little journey in design and take you to Singapore and tell us a little bit about your work there. Well, I was um, practicing before I was head of design at Glasgow School of Art. And so I went from Glasgow to Singapore to become a Dean of Faculty of Design, which was in 2000. And five so it's kind of early days for Singapore developing design education so I had a very fortunate and an enjoyable experience of really structuring and developing design education there as well as meeting a whole set of people involved in design and one of them being Theseus Chan who's very well celebrated um, an important designer for Singapore who's worked and practiced there um, for his career um, and is a very individual and interesting designer. Um, he developed his own imprint from his design studio um, called Work, W-E-R-K. Um, and I got involved when I was in Singapore with the beginning of, of, of one of the work um, publications um, around an illustration filmmaker called Joe McGee. Um, so that kind of started my interest in starting to write and look at the individual practitioner's voice coming through. So over the years, I've, I've worked with Theseus on three publications and each one has probably become more, um, well, more text and, and image Interesting. So, I mean, your 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 practice obviously is developing iteratively as you go through the experience of of different people, and I guess different the different people that you you focus, the different people you focus on will bring different needs and focus uh, to the to the work itself. You moved then from Singapore, and maybe I could uh, note another um, creative uh, arm that you have, the textile collective because there was a book with one of your colleagues from that, Fraser Taylor, that you worked on. Yeah, well, I've known Fraser over a number of years, and Fraser 
was work, living and working in Chicago and working at the Chicago Institute of Fine Arts for a number of years. Um, and just, he would come back and forward to Glasgow and he had taken a sab year's sabbatical, so had been drawing, painting throughout Scotland and was planning an exhibition. So he asked if I would curate the exhibition and I said, well, why don't we look at a publication so I took that idea to, to Theseus as a as an I you know as a concept, but also Fraser's um, one of his sort of biggest influences, Rose Wiley, the artist who she and her husband Roy Oxley ran very innovative workshops for non professionals as well as professionals over a number of years. Um, anyway, so this was really to look at. Fraser's practice, but in conversation with Rose. So I, I set up a, Fantastic, yeah. a workshop where they would work independently of each other in their, in their studios, but would come together and discuss the work, which really created then the content for the publication. So and the they each worked on art pieces? Yeah, they, we had the idea of, well, we were in Rose's house, where she works. So there's a she has her own studio and then Roy's studio. That's through Fraser yeah. worked. Okay. Yeah. And so yeah, we had a three day they had a three day workshop and I sort of facilitated conversations about what they were doing. Mm. And so the work that they produced in those in that period of time then became the basis of the exhibition. But then the publication also did a, a this is obviously included retrospective work um i mean i think this is where your books are for me i i've now become the person who goes to the exhibition and rummages around in the in the, the pull out drawers for the early sketches and the and the memorabilia that, that might be added into a layered uh personal history that backs up and gives context to the the main works that you know people come that i also go to enjoy so that's fantastic so you're actually it feels like you're putting in book form the intensity of a, a layered rigorous exhibition yeah i think that what you say is understanding the context as well as process as well as end product of, of whatever that might be whether it's on canvas or paper or in 3d construction really mm. it's the whole process and, and the contextualization of practice and the artist's voice at the centre of that, that I'm very interested in, and I've explored really since the early days with the, the first publications with Theseus in Singapore. So, and yeah. your your latest, um, I I know is a wallpaper designer, Martha, and was that a a similar process, or did that differ in in your approach with that one? Well, Martha, I didn't, I didn't know Martha before we started. It was this is Martha Armitage, I should have Martha said. Martha Armitage, yeah. So Martha Armitage has practiced as an artist all her life, and she has developed very beautiful hand-produced wallpaper. So her process is based in drawing and then translated into liner blocks and then printing on to paper. Um, I mean, really, block, pre block printing. Well, she started off with block printing, but then um, in the six, early, so late 60s, she bought an old offset litho prints. So she still, she set that up and that's what's still used. So really wonderful, right. exactly, it's a two color process, which because of her design and, and use of the lino block and cleverly using two color prints, of course, looks a lot more um, color use of color than there actually is um, and then also things like printing on gold where that then brings another kind of lustrous element into her collection so she really worked as a singular practitioner for a number of years and then I think early 90s she um, was persuaded to become part of a, a wallpaper company who had started looking at um, antique wallpapers that they'd collected from buildings that were being knocked down so oh wow yeah, that's where they started and then 
that really sort of brought her work to the forefront and, and yeah she's sort of really over the last 15 years she's she's had great success and now of course her wallpapers are highly desirable and collectible and you have to wait in a great waiting list for them and they're you know and speaking of waiting list i haven't got that book yet but i'm very excited about it. i've asked you to if you had a copy of the martha armitage book do you have that I've asked you. You. so we can so it's i'm looking right. forward to this the detail but there are different versions of it yeah. uh, that's so a very lovely one it's got the the lino embossed cover on yeah. Yeah. There are other ones very cleverly wrapped with uh versions of, i think four different versions of the yeah. and then there's a special limited edition which she's printed one of her early what she calls floor prints which is what she did literally printed on the floor before she had her press so the limited edition is printed by her for the book. Oh, wonderful. Really lovely. Well, I'll save up. Um, Alison, I think we're, we're just about through in terms of time. I want to say a big thank you for, for joining me uh, today and helping us understand a little bit more about your journey in design and about the wonderful folk that you've been able to collaborate with as well. And thank you for nurturing design talent through your uh, work as an educationalist and through your um, work at the foundation, Bernard Klein Foundation, and for your wonderful books. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, John. Bye-bye.